uh, have any questions, put them into the question facility that some of you have already used just to confirm that you can hear me. Um, Rattle any questions at any time you like in there, and at the end of the session, I'll come back to them and answer them in turn. It's the best way of handling it. We've got an awful lot of this stuff to go through this evening, so I'll leave the questions till the end. When we get to the end of the session, I'll let you know. It all will almost be self-evident, of course. Those that need to disappear on time, you can leave. <laughs> Those that want to listen to the answers to your questions or just listen to the answers, irrespective of whether you asked a question or not, you're more than welcome to hang on. And I'll just keep, normally I just keep going until I've answered every question. And if there are people still hanging on, I'll still hang on as well. Um, the, um, yeah, it doesn't matter how you've system set up. So in regards to webcams and speakers, you should be able to hear me, see the slides. But the, uh, the, 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 there's no way I can see you. You can't see me. Um, and I can't hear you, however loud you shout. So um, let's kick off with um, what we're going to be talking about this evening. Um, the, the, there is an awful lot to go through, so I'm going to go at a fairly rapid pace. That's why I'm quite happy to answer questions afterwards. Um, it's all fairly clear, but we, we, we've got to do a lot to uh, keep it within the hour or anywhere close to. Okay. Who on earth are we? Well, many of you have been invited via Talent Spa or an association with them. Some of you would have been invited through other um, channels. Maybe you missed uh, one of our earlier webinars. You've registered, but you didn't get around to see it. So welcome to you all. Just very briefly um, to explain um, who on earth we are so you have some indication of um, what we're about. Um, I work for a business called CV and Interview Advisors. Um, we exist to provide this kind of information that you're about to receive this evening. Um, we uh, provide our clients with CV writing, LinkedIn profile writing, interview coaching services. Um, the key reason I mention that is we know what we're doing, uh, or we like to think we know what we're doing. More importantly, it's proven, as you will see. So we didn't just wake up one morning thinking it'd be a great idea to spend Monday evenings talking to people about these sorts of things. Um, there is some logic behind it. The stuff you're going to learn about this evening does work, um, genuinely does work. And if you follow the instructions, so to speak, you too can have a, a far more effective CV and LinkedIn profile. Um, again, just to reinforce the fact that um, hopefully we've got some credibility. Um, my own background is that I've been an employer. I've recruited people as an employer. I've worked in recruitment for my sins, uh, both permanent contract, freelance market. Uh, I've reviewed probably now tens of thousands of CVs in my time with this business, and I've written a fair few CVs as well. So the main message there is we, we and my colleagues have seen kind of way CVs are used, how people use LinkedIn profiles, how people search for information and candidates and talent. Um, and we see that across all sorts of sectors, for all sorts of jobs, at all sorts of levels, in all sorts of countries. And you can't fail but pick up trends, information, observations, which we can then feed back to the market. I've indicated the colleagues that I work with all very similar backgrounds. Interestingly, some of them are published authors. And that will become really important as to why that's a a talent and a tribute to have. There are going to be a few cliches this evening, I'm afraid, because it's the best way to describe some things which otherwise are difficult to describe. And one of those cliches is hot skills. Um, and it will get mentioned more than once, but it is really important. Um, and, and the issue here is that you are a product or service. However you uh, uh, like or dislike that kind of concept, in effect, that's crudely what you are, that somebody's got a problem out there, you possibly are the solution. Crudely, you're seen as a product or a service with a cost attached to it. If you can align your skills that you have to the market expectations, what you've got to offer matches what the employer is looking for, that's a good sign. But it does help if you know what those skills are. Uh, and, and that will become apparent as we go through this evening. So. Uh, we tend to find those out pretty quick. We, we collect and collate them. What was popular five months ago, five years ago, 15 years ago isn't necessarily so now. But it is really important to know what is topical, what employers are looking for. Bottom line is we write CVs and other bits and pieces that work. Um, just to prove the point, um, we ran this webinar um, during February um, for a partner. And um, somebody was listening, of course, um, took some action. Uh, we were able to help them. 
uh, they've been really struggling. So the text that's on the screen now is an extract from an email they sent us shortly afterwards, in effect saying, you know, it does work. I've had the success. I was really struggling to get in interest and attention. And when I say struggling, as you can see, in three years, really not moved forward. They had some specific issues which needed addressing, but we sorted it, and they suddenly were getting interest and attention from the kind of people they wanted to for jobs that they felt they should deservedly get interviews and attention for. And that's all as a consequence of putting into practice what I'm going to be talking about this evening. Now, before we get into the detail, there's some really important things that you need to know. Um, and I will encourage you to, of course, think about your existing CV. It rather helps to know where you might currently be before you decide to take any radical action, because you may not need to, in fairness. So there's just a few things to look out for and, and maybe ask yourself the question about in regards to your own CV. And uh, one of the traps that people fall into, um, which at first glance may not seem such a hideous hideous problem, but, but will become apparent how much of a problem this causes folks. If So I, again, I'd encourage you, ask yourself this question, think about your own CV. If your CV currently is just basically a list of things, jobs, qualifications, hobbies, interests, contact details, uh, professional training, continual professional development, if it's just a list of those things with no real added value, no real substance, that is a danger sign, a warning sign, if you like, for reasons that will become clear very shortly. If you're using the same format of CV that you've pretty much had since you left college, school, university, and all you've done is add to it over time, maybe edit a bit out, but, but essentially the same document in terms of its structure and construction, again, big warning sign. And the bigger the warning, uh, the bigger the warning sign is, the longer your career has been, for reasons, again, we'll shortly see. And ask yourself the question, are you actually aligning your CV to what the marketplace is expecting? Most people don't, strangely. It's very easy to do in the great scheme of things, but most people miss it, and some people miss it by a country mile. Another piece of uh, cliche for you, which is going to get mentioned more than once, target audience. So if we, if we know or if it's important to address and link your CV to the hot skills in the marketplace, the target audience are the people looking at that and making the decision on whether you've got that right or not. The target audience is a varied bunch of people. It could be recruiters, hiring managers, um, HR people within an employer, third party outplaced organizations doing the recruitment for a particular organization, or any combination of all of those people. Um, it's just basically the bunch of folk that are going to make a judgment on your CV. And of course, each of those parties have different interests and different motivations sometimes. But it's really important to try and get your document, your CV, aligned to what that target audience is expecting to see. So in their mind, there's a picture. It's the ideal candidate. They've spec'd it out, however loosely or so, or tightly. But they've, they've got this picture in their mind. The people that are going to get the interviews are the ones that are sending a document, a CV, that in effect creates and conjures up, conveys that picture that's the best fit doesn't matter how good you are as a candidate at this stage, it's how you come across via your CV. So really important. And to fine tune that little bit more, um, probably the most important message you should take away from this evening, if there is only one thing you take away, take away this please, and that is your CV should present its target audience with a strong business case as to why somebody should consider interviewing you. Forget about the hiring bit right now, because that's further on down the process. The CV's job is to get you the interview, the attention, the engagement. Um, and, and it's really important that you present a business case to your target audience as to why they should interview you. Now, we'll touch on what on earth a business case is and how to do that later. That's the biggest part of this evening, both via CV and LinkedIn. But essentially, if you've ever bought anything for work or for pleasure, um, it's unlikely you just woke up one morning saying, right, I'm going out to buy it, if it's particularly if it's a high price ticket item, uh, particularly if you're in business and you um, have to go and buy a new piece of equipment, software, hardware, capital expenditure for some capital equipment, premises. You just can't make it happen. You just can't go and wander up to somebody and say, please give me £500,000. It's really important because I need to go and do this. It just doesn't happen. You have to provide a business case, a justification to whoever that person is, the target audience, 
as to why they should give you that money. Treat yourself, you as a product service, as a brand, the same way. You have to persuade your target audience, this bunch of recruiters, hiring managers, employers, whatever, with a, a high, um, high impact compelling message as to why they should be interested in you. If you get that message right, if you get that business case sorted, you will automatically achieve more. You'll get more interviews for better jobs, guaranteed. If you get it wrong, you probably won't get many interviews at all, or not for the jobs that you really think you deserve the interviews for. So really important that we'll spend a lot of time on that this evening. So unsurprisingly, in our view, and proven by the marketplace, bad TV is just a list of stuff. A good CV is one that actually takes that list. You can't change what you've done and where you've done it, of course. You can't change the qualifications you've got. What you choose to mention and how you choose to mention it can be completely changed, as we'll see. That's what helps make a good, strong business case. If you've got a good, strong business case, you'll be more successful in the marketplace. Now, some people tend to ask, um, uh, either now or later, um, or if we're talking to people on the phone um, during our day-to-day -day work, if you like, Okay, well, what difference can it make if I get my CV properly sorted? It doesn't matter who's doing it. It could be you. You could go off this evening, tomorrow, next weekend, write a better CV. As long as you're putting together a proper, strong, relevant business case to your target audience, you will see a very marked increase in success in the marketplace. A bit like that chap whose email extract I showed you almost at the beginning. They saw a material difference, a substantial difference between what they were struggling to do for three years beforehand and then having sorted it, got their CV sorted, went out into the marketplace, suddenly getting interest. It's that dramatic. Now, on average, when we're writing CVs for our clients, that's the information we can assess because we've got control of it, we see a substantial double-digit increase in getting interview success or the number of interviews. Sometimes it's markedly more but the average is hovering around the 30 to 50% increment in interview hit rate. So it can make a big difference, and that's all by following the steps you'll see this evening and presenting your target audience with a strong business case as to why they should interview you. Most people don't do it. Most people just write a list of stuff and think that's enough. As we'll see, it isn't. Another piece of interesting information which most people can assess themselves as to whether your CV is doing its job or not. This is very appropriate for people who are active in the marketplace um, or have recently been active in the marketplace going for jobs. And that is what we call the acid test. So a very important message, not quite as important as building a business case, but nevertheless important because this gives you something to assess your document now or in the future. And it is a very simple statistic, uh, but it's surprising how many people don't quite get its importance or choose to act accordingly on the information when presented to them. And the key thing here is that if you apply for, a, let's say you apply for 10 jobs, as long as those 10 jobs are a reasonable level, they might be a stretch for you, but technically you, hand on heart, believe that you could perform them. If you're getting no interviews for those 10 jobs or one or two interviews, it would suggest something's going wrong, of course, something's not right. And I can virtually guarantee that the problem is the CV, whatever anybody may tell you. This is why it is the acid test, because you will get, if you've been active in the job market and not wholly successful, you will get all sorts of reasons as to why you've not been successful at getting interviews. This is not about getting jobs, remember. This is purely about getting interviews. Once you're in the interview process and people are meeting you and then making decisions on second interview, third interviews, or whatever, or job offers, those are wholly different criteria being judged. But the CV, and to an extent, an increasing extent, your LinkedIn profile's job, is to get you interviews for opportunities. And if you're not getting the interviews, be very wary of accepting the explanations you might sometimes be given about why not. It's got nothing to do with the economic climate. If you've applied for a job, you've applied for a job. Just because the economic climate is tough, it makes no difference on whether you should be getting an interview or not, to some degree. Um, I'll clarify that in a minute. Uh, whether you applied for one, ten, ten thousand jobs, again, it matters not. If you're a valid applicant for those roles, you know hand on heart you could perform them, you ought to be getting a reasonable share of interviews. It's unreasonable to expect you'll get interviews for everything, but you ought to be getting your fair share. It doesn't matter what the quality uh, of your competition is. That had no material bearing on whether you're getting interviews or not. 
if you just look at it from the point of view your capability. If you know your capability is strong and you're surprised you're not getting interviews, I can virtually guarantee, as I say, the reason why is because somebody somewhere is looking at your CV and they are not compelled to do something about it. They don't get the message in the same way as you'd like them to get it. They can't see the value you could bring to their organization or their client in the same way that you believe you might see it. And that's always or nearly always down to your CV and the quality of the message on it. So if you've been active in the market, currently in the market, and you know those stats and you're struggling to get interviews, then you can do something about it. And tonight's just part of that process. But do do something about it. Don't listen to people saying, better luck next time, or it's tough because there are better people qualified for the role, or you are overqualified or underqualified. That's it may be true. In some cases, those explanations may be true. But what it's hiding is that still, somebody somewhere didn't like your CV enough to get you for interview. And that is what the CV is there to do. So fix the problem. And you'll see there are two options, really. You either do it yourself, following the steps we'll talk about this evening, or you get professional help. But for a lot of people, this is a bit of a revelation. It's actually, I do need to do something about it. So please do do something about it. Don't just sit. And, and accept that it's something else causing the problem. OK, let's move on to what on earth might start to help. Um, these are the areas we're going to talk about this evening, uh, some in more detail than others, because we just don't have the time to go into detail on all of these points. But this is what we would say is an effective CV structure. This is not to say you must have a CV that follows this structure precisely. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm just trying to give you an indication that you can now compare your CV against something that we know works in the marketplace. And then that might help you decide whether you're far adrift from the ideal or not, or something that at least you know might work or not. So these, these sections are in order pretty much on how they'd appear on the CV, are broadly the areas that we think are important. And as I say, I'll talk about a little bit more um, during the course of the evening session. The top three, however, and I did promise that I would explain what on earth made a business case. Well, the top three areas which we'll spend most time on are the areas that will really make a difference. Get them right, and you've built a very strong business case as to why somebody should be interested in interviewing you. Get them wrong, and I can virtually guarantee you won't get any interviews. And we'll do a bit of comparison with what you've currently got on your CV and what you should have as we go through the session you can start then to make some decisions and evaluate where you're at. So that's what we're going to talk about. So let's take them one by one. Starting with what I've called, and again, what these sections are called doesn't really matter a whole heap as long as you don't deviate too far from the same meanings. Most people uh, open up their CV with, I say most, probably about half, just over half of CVs that I see open up their CV with some kind of opening sentence or paragraph. And you may well have one of those at the top of your CV or near the top. You may have called it personal profile or profile, personal summary. It doesn't really matter what you call it. We tend to call it a professional or executive summary. But what's absolutely key is the, the content, a rule which applies throughout the CV, of course. The style, the font creativity lurking behind the document is massively secondary to the actual content. And now, remember, we're building the business case. This is step one, part one, of building the business case out of three really important areas on the CV. Now, start to ask yourself these kind of questions. Um, we think the most important thing to state pretty quickly on your CV in this opening statement is exactly what you are. Now, this, can, this varies, of course, for each individual. Uh, the sentiment here is not to describe yourself necessarily by your job title, although it may be exactly that, but it's to generically, but fairly specifically, if that makes sense, describe what you are so that your target audience, remember these recruiters, hiring managers, employers, whatever, they look at your CV and the very first thing they see, other than who you are, is pretty much a verification that you are in the right space. So if the recruiter is looking for a hiring man, sorry, uh, looking for a project manager, I might be looking for a hiring manager, but if they're looking for a project manager, almost the first thing you're saying is, look, here I am, I am a project manager. 
I'm an experienced project manager. I'm a Prince 2 qualified project manager, but something that reaffirms pretty much what they're looking for. It's a bit crudely, this is a bit of an exaggeration, but let's just imagine that you need somebody to come into your house and paint the walls red. So if somebody slipped through a piece of paper through your door or had a website that crazily was all about painting your walls red, you'd feel pretty comfortable they could come, a, come and do a good job for you. If, however, the person had put something through your door and emblazoned on paper said, I'll come and paint your floors black, it doesn't resonate to quite the same degree. Now, it's, although it sounds a bit of a crazy example, the, the interesting thing there is there is a transferable skill, of course, which is painting something a certain color. But you'd be surprised how many people make decisions based on emotions that are unfathomable sometimes. So make it easy for the recruiter, make it easier for the hiring manager. If they're looking for X, make sure you're saying that you are X. Don't leave it until later on the CV. Don't wait until you get into your career history to explain it. Tell them straight away that you're pretty much what they're looking for in terms of the function. Now you can add all sorts of things to this, and I'll show you an example shortly. But if you're degree educated, you could put you're a graduate. If you've got lots of experience, you could say that you're experienced before you insert the, the, the phrase that explains what you are. If you've got specific qualifications, as I said earlier, like PRINCE2, or you're, if you're in testing, ISEB, um, or if you've got an MBA, MBA, um, or any other major recognized professional qualification, you can insert that ahead of the descriptor that you are a project manager, a school teacher, a doctor, um, a salesperson, a business development person, a marketing manager, whatever you may be, you can add an appropriate tag to explain the level that you're at if that's required. But pretty quickly you're saying exactly what they're wanting to see. Very simple, but how many people are doing that right now? I'd suggest very few. The second thing you need to be making pretty clear, if you remember I described earlier, try and see yourself as a product or service to the marketplace for which somebody's going to invest some money in you. So it doesn't matter what that amount of money is, be it 15,000, 50,000, 150,000, 250,000, should you be so lucky. The core thing here is that you've got to try and provide on your CV some evidence to support why on earth somebody should be making that investment in you. And m most people fail that miserably. Um, because they're either too close to what they're doing or they don't understand the mechanics. But in this current climate particularly, always think, what can I do to justify why somebody should be paying me my salary? What's the core reason I exist in this particular role that I'm doing right now, which may be relevant to my next job? We describe that as being the value proposition. I'll show you an example very soon. You link that to things that you're particularly good at. Most people have got three or four things they're really strong at. And it's important you get that message across. But of course, they need to be linked to these infamous hot skills again. So the recruiter, hirer, employer, they've spec'd out a job, an ideal candidate. They're going to be looking for certain skills. Make sure in this opening statement you're trying to make a match between the skills you justifiably have in your toolkit and what that particular recruiter or employer are looking for. I promise you an example. Um, looks a bit of a wall of text on the screen because I've had to obviously increase the text size, but this is a real life example um, for a particular individual. I'm not going to read it verbatim, you can read it yourselves, <coughs> excuse me, but it describes or provides, I should say, information on all of those four bullets that we've just been through. What are they? An experienced finance director. It doesn't matter what their precise title is, finance director is pretty generic. Um, it's is a good indicator at the level and skill set this person might have. So for example, if the recruiter employer are looking for a finance director or a finance controller or a um, group finance director, it, it just reaffirms to them they're looking at somebody who's the right level. They're not a welder, um, they're not a um, janitor, and they're not anything else completely irrelevant to that job. And you'd be surprised how many people apply for jobs who are in no way qualified. You do not want to get tarred with that brush. And that's another reason why this is so important. So describe what you are, they have. Uh, what's their value proposition? Well, it's lurking around that protecting cash flow and profitability statement. What are they good at? There's a list of things aligned with the hot skills in the marketplace. Well, we have to assume so. It would certainly look that way at first glance, but we don't know because we don't know the individual and we don't know the job they're applying for, but it would seem to be relevant and appropriate. 
Now, the important thing here, again, thinking about your own CV, the vast majority of CVs that I see where there is some kind of opening statement like this, or I should say like this in terms of the amount of text and what they're trying to do, fail because they talk about a whole heap of skills that are behavioral rather than functional and or technical. And I'll give you an example. So if you've got any of these phrases in your opening statement, I can guarantee you're all ready at a disadvantage. So if you're talking about your levels of enthusiasm, dynamism, commitment, passion, um, the real horror one, which is I can work well in a team or as an individual, or I give 110%, or I'm very, very strong uh, with interpersonal skills or communication skills. Those are admirable qualities in their own right, of course. Most employers would be looking for those skills. And in fairness, they might have put in the job advertisement, we need people with enthusiasm, drive, dedication, blah, blah, blah. But they're not assessing you on those abilities via the CV. There'll be a matrix somewhere for most recruiters and hirers. They'll be assessing those qualities at interview or assessment center or some point later on in the process. Just by putting I am enthusiastic on your CV is not a key to the door of an interview and if you believe that then you will not be as successful as you ought to be so if you've got any reference to those kind of behavioral traits so as I say enthusiasm dedication commitment interpersonal skills working as a an individual or as part of a team any of those things they are not helping you most people tend to write that stuff because they've seen it somewhere they think it's right they think they're reflecting the skills being sought by the recruiter but what they fail to get right or uh, to recognize is the recruiter is not judging them. It's not gonna, you're not going to get an interview merely by replicating stuff you can't possibly prove on your CV. Now, if you can prove how enthusiastic you are on your CV, you deserve a medal. If you can prove that you're more or less enthusiastic than anybody else that's applied for the job, you deserve a better medal. And if you can display any proof whatsoever that you can work in a team or as an individual on your CV, again, you, you deserve some kind of prize. They're all virtually impossible to prove on the CV, so why mention them? Focus instead on the stuff you can prove. Now, as we'll see later, this particular individual can go on and describe things that they did through ways and means that I will talk with you about that will prove or provide evidence to support the claims they've made. You cannot, if you've got enthusiasm, interpersonal skills, working in a team or as an individual on your CV, you can't prove any of those until you get in front of somebody and they're not strong enough examples to get you in front of people by and large. It's not to say you won't get any interviews, but you'll, you'll be getting them on the wrong criteria. You're not controlling things. You might be just lucky. You might live in the right area. There might not have been very many applicants for the job, unlikely in the current climate, but there's probably it's probably not because you mentioned you're enthusiastic on your CV. So that's part one of the CV and how to build your business case, a really strong factual professional or executive summary or opening statement. Second part, before we look also, um, I, I will show you a real life CV to show you how it all sort of comes together. Uh, key skills or expertise, again, it doesn't, doesn't really matter what the title is, but this is an area where you can reflect the skills, again, functional or technical that are being sought by the recruiter or hirer has two main advantages, one of which is that anything you put on your CV these days, of course, as soon as it hits a database, will make it less or more easy to search for. So if you get the content right, you'll have heard people talking about keywords and phrases and getting them on your CV. Now, most people, when they have a go at that, they do it very clumsily. It's very obvious they've tried to force things into the CV to make it appear. Um, and that works to some degree, but of course when you actually read the document it makes little sense or not as much sense as it should. You have to be a bit clever about it. But if you actually follow this um, structure uh, past the CV, you can achieve the same aim, but very cleverly. So digitally, when your CV hits a database, uh, LinkedIn, job board, if you get these keywords and phrases right, and reflect the things that you can justifiably prove but are relevant to your target audience. It's a really great way of making sure you appear higher up people's search orders and on lists. But it's also visually a very good way of displaying information that the reader might find useful. So there's a few examples just appearing on the screen right now. Um, they're, um, it could be anything. I mean, they, 
these are just examples. They tend to be finance related because of this finance director that we've been looking at. Um, but they're typically two, three, four word maybe phrases. They're things that we know people search for. They're things that would be being sought for the type of job the individual is applying for. So that's important. You don't just list random things. You list things that are relevant to your target audience. This is helping to build the business case. If you just list random things, that's not building a business case. It's just a list of stuff, which, as I said earlier, is the wrong approach. Now, um, we tend on the CV, as you'll soon see when I show you the real life example, um, they are bullets just as they're appearing on the screen, maybe five to seven on the left hand side and a balancing amount on the right hand side. Also, they're not behavioral, so there's no mention. Some people might have bullet points on their CV right now and they'll say interpersonal skills as a strength, um, that enthusiasm is a strength. Teamwork is a strength. Again, very difficult to prove. Most people tend to write that sort of thing because they can't think of anything better to say. So all you're doing is looking like all of the other applicants or most of the other applicants for the job. The ones that get in the interviews, more often than not, if you look at the CVs, they're the ones that have taken the time to say, I think what these people are looking for is this. I've got that in my toolkit. Here's the proof. Here's the evidence. Surprise, surprise, they tend to get the, in tend to get the interviews. And you as an individual, if you're not one of those people, you'll never know. What you'll hear back is, oh, there were better people for the job. Not your CV wasn't strong enough. There were better people for the job. How did they know those people were better for the job? Well, they didn't. They just looked at the CV and thought, this person looks more appropriate for my or my client's needs. That's what they're saying. Couldn't make a judgment because they've not met you. So they could make a judgment on the content you've sent them. Now, just a brief comment about, before we look at a real life example, um, that earlier professional summary I showed you for the finance director, what I should also have made quite clear is that it doesn't matter what level you're at. Um, just because we, because we called it a professional summary doesn't mean to say you have to be a high level professional. Everybody can write something more powerful than they've probably got on their CV right now. And that doesn't matter whether you've just graduated and have no work experience at all even if you have no part-time job experience at all. It doesn't matter. You can write a very effective summary. Um, it doesn't matter what level you are in a business. It doesn't matter whether that's a, what you would consider a menial administrative job or a high-powered executive job. That has no bearing on this opening uh, sentiment or statement. Nor does it matter what level you are in terms of writing these key skills. All I'm providing are examples. For everybody, there are different examples, but I guarantee it matters not one jot what level you are. So if you've just graduated, looking for your entry-level role, you can still apply all of these techniques to your CV. You just have to switch things around a little bit and think about what the target audience are looking for. Now, the second point, just before we look at this real-life example, which I sort of hinted at, but is really, really important, uh, it's in red at the bottom of the screen. The vast majority of recruiters and hiring managers, as I sort of suggested, can only make their decision about who to interview based on the contents of your CV. And you might think, well, yeah, of course, that's obvious, isn't it? But that is the very point. Most people are sending, relatively speaking, ineffective documents that are the only means that the recruiter or hiring manager can make a decision on. They haven't got a crystal ball. They can't look into it and sort of imagine how good you are at your job every day. If you fail to articulate that on your CV, you will lose out. You may technically be an ideal candidate, but if your CV is ineffective, you won't get the interview. And again, most people fail to grasp hold of how important that is. A lot of people say, um, oh, no, no, but I haven't put that on my CV. I'll explain it when I get the interview. And they fail to make the connection that the reason they're not getting to interview is because they've not mentioned anything relevant to their target audience. So this is where this business case comes in. And we're on the second part of building this business case. First part was professional summary. Second part, these key skill area. Let's take a look at a real life example. Then you can see how it starts to look. So on the screen, gradually, what you should be seeing is uh, Matt Craven's, um, the guy that runs our business. It's his, he's, it's, uh, it's his CV, real life. Obviously, the positioning and what he's talking about are bespoke to him, but that's the same for everybody. Everybody's different. There's nothing you can copy and paste and suddenly make this work. It just doesn't work like that. 
um, you have to think, what would be people looking for in Matt's world? And how can he make the best use of what he's got against those expectations? So he's got an executive summary. So he's called to choose it. It's describing what, is, what he is, what's his value proposition, things he's good at, aligning it with the hot skills in the marketplace. Then you see the bullet points headed expertise. There are a handful of things, actually slightly more than a handful. That's probably about as many as you'd want on a CV, truth be told. You wouldn't want to go much beyond that. I think that's what, that's seven or eight down each side, uh, seven down each side. Um, that's probably about as far as you want to take it for a number of reasons. But nevertheless, there are phrases and keywords that might be searched for in his space, in his world, that would elevate his CV further up search list. But visually, as you can see, it's dead easy to quickly think, OK, this is what he is. Might not read all the blurb, but you know, is this a valid applicant? Certainly looks like it. Where is key areas of expertise? OK, he's highlighted them. Yeah, that all looks good. That's relevant. Yeah, I'm feeling positive about this individual. Big green tick. I shall read further, or I might actually just put them in the maybe pile right now. What you see on screen now is pretty much what an average recruiter would see in their software package that might have aggregated all applications into one place. So most recruiters now hire across multiple platforms. Uh, most recruiters will have some clever technology, third-party technology sometimes, maybe in the house technology, that will bring all of those applications in one space. They sit down and they look through all of the applications they've received. Now, unfortunately for most recruiters, most applications tend to attract hundreds of applicants and that initial excitement of, wow, we've got lots of people applied for this job, soon wears off when they start reading the CVs, I can guarantee you, because I've been there. You scan through the CV, you might give it 5 to 20 seconds during that filtering stage. So what, and again, a lot of candidates don't realize is that they're just one of literally tens, if not hundreds, and sometimes thousands of applicants. If you're in the thousands, it's probably being done by some automatic system to start with, but there's a filtering process. Now, that filtering process lasts very, very long. Uh, little time. It's a quick, am I looking at somebody that's right or not for this job based on what I can see in roughly the space you're looking at right now. So if you're not differentiating yourself here, if you're not creating that strong business case or even hinting at it, it could be game over within the time it's taking you to read X percent of what you see on screen, not even all of it. It's just quick scan read, valid applicants or not, yay or nay five to 20 seconds. Okay, so two sections really important, building the business case, or at least beginning to build the business case. Let's look at um, the third area, because that's quite important. So far, we've had a document that, in Matt's case, and this finance director's case that we were looking at earlier, have both stated, okay, this is what I am, this is what I'm good at, this is what I've got to offer the world, this is a hint at the kind of return I can give on your investment, Mr. or Mrs. Employer. Um, here are some of my skills. You could arguably say, yeah, 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 but that's you know, all claims. Where's the proof? Where's the proof? And that's a fair observation. Um, and so the next section, the third most, uh, not third most important, sorry, the third section building the business case. Remember those three areas I said we'd focus on, we've dealt with two of them. This is the third one. We call it career highlights. It's all about the proof. It's evidence to back up claims that we've just made at, on the CV to date. Now, I mentioned that we had in our team some published authors. It's just a bit of a tongue-in-cheek uh, remark because this next bit is really important and where having a good creative mind and also a good way of constructing content, it, it is really important, in fact. Now, we, we're about to, or well, I'm about to show you how we create uh, highlights of your career that can be written in a nice, concise way. Get across a message about uh, proving your ability to do something. Uh, we use something called STAR. It's not revolutionary. Lots of people use it in industry or something similar. There's all sorts of variations on a the theme. But for our purposes and for tonight, we're going to talk about STAR. STAR stands for Situation, Task, Actions, Result. And it's a really nifty way of deconstructing complex events, projects, achievements in your life and then reconstructing them in a nice, concise fashion that's easy for people to understand. So here's an example. Now, this is off Matt's CV, as we'll shortly see. Um, I'm not going to read it again. You can read it yourself. But what's important is just to highlight the sections. 
So this is something that Matt did in his career. It actually happens to be quite a long time ago, but that's not important. It's still a relevant, appropriate achievement in his life. He wants to mention it on his CV. And the way he does it is by describing the situation first. That's the first sentence of this paragraph on screen. Uh, Iraq stands for Enterprise Rent-A-Car, just so you know. It's a well-known company. Um, and uh, it's a, the situation is the scene setter, if you like, the headline, the description about this event. And it's the Enterprise Rent-A-Car uh, Enterprise rent -a -car acquired an unprofitable competitor and basically it needed sorting out. So that's the situation. The task is the responsibility resting on Matt's shoulder at that particular moment in time. And that was basically to sort it out as operations manager. The, we, the actions are the bulk of the text, which is a series of things, typically four or five things that the individual did to improve matters or to progress matters. And then the result is the final sentence. And that is succeeded in rebranding the business, achieving a certain level of profitability within a certain time period. So you can see the big event took a long time, probably caused lots of heartache, roller coaster ride, ups and downs. But in a nutshell, and it is almost a nutshell, you can describe something quite concisely, quite briefly. But it's a nice compelling story. It's evidence to back up claims that Matt had made earlier on his CV. Everybody can write this kind of stuff. Even again, graduates often say, um, or people with very little work experience, say, oh, I've got no experience, I've, got, I've had no jobs, I've had no recent jobs, or how can I write? You just switch it around. You think, okay, if you don't have career highlights as such because you've had no career, you flip it and say, okay, what's my target audience looking for? They're looking for evidence to support my ability to do things well. Uh, what those things are, the competences, if you like, vary from job to job, employer to employer. So if you're a graduate, you probably have had some kind of part-time job that will have given you competencies. It might be meeting people, dealing with conflicts, conflict resolution, handling money, project management, if you've had to arrange anything, or at university or college or school, or wherever you've been, you've been involved in organizing any event of any description. You really get under the skin of what you've been up to and think, has that given me any competencies that I can make something of? If you've got a career, you pick examples from your career, of course. But the important thing is, because there are some things to be wary of, you just can't pick any old example. It's a bit like with the key skills and the professional summary. If you talk about stuff you can't prove, it's bad. It makes it look weak. It makes you look like a failure, and that sounds a bit dramatic. But it does. You'd be surprised what a difference it makes when you read it. So pick strong examples. The examples you pick do need to be relevant. So if you're in IT, for example, and you're claiming one of your career highlights was to launch Windows 95 to the masses, Whilst that might write for in relevance 20 odd years ago, it isn't relevant now. And you'd have a hard job trying to impress somebody by talking about that. But you'd be surprised how many people make mistakes like that. So pick relevant, targeted examples that your audience will find compelling. Not everybody has a kind of job where their career highlights can be measured in the same way as that we just saw on Matt's CV. So it's not, again, don't worry, just because I've given you an example which said this guy created profit in such a small period of time, he must be like some kind of superhero. You know, at a level, that was his job, it was an expectation. The kind of jobs you tend to go for will be relative to what you've been doing for a period of time in your life. So people aren't going to suddenly expect you to have changed the world to join them as an organization. So don't get het up about thinking of examples where you know you've been just a small cog on a big machine. The point is, you can always draw out some of those highlights. You may have improved processes, you may have solved problems that you take for granted, but actually your audience would find quite compelling. But if you can put some kind of KPI, key performance indicator to them, of course, that makes a whole heap of sense. And for certain jobs, it's really important. If you're a finance director, you need to be able to give that sort of evidence. If you're in sales at whatever level, you must be able to give some evidence of targets, um, growth, new business development, that kind of thing. Um, and if you're a purchaser or a buyer or a procurer, again, there's got to be some kind of evidence. Otherwise, people would think, well, hang on a minute, what on earth have you been up to? But if you're in admin um, or accounts or HR, then may, particularly if you're in the lower echelons, it may be harder for you to grab sort of world-changing examples. But that's not the point. You can still pick examples of stuff that you've done that differentiates you from others. 
interestingly, when we're working with our clients, this is probably the single area that's the toughest. You know, we really do have to get under the skin of some people and in the nicest possible way extract from them the information we need because sometimes it is well hidden and people are generally speaking fairly modest about their success. But it is really important. This makes a huge difference to how people think of you when they see your CV. Okay, quickly, before we look at other sections of the CV, I'm going to show you Matt's CV again, um, and we'll just take a look at what we've talked about. So what you see on screen now are the three sections I said we'd talk a bit about, which we have, um, and they are the three sections that make your business case, or the vast majority of it. There are some examples of people, and we know it happens, being pulled for interview almost purely on what you see on screen right now. Conversely, you get it wrong, and I can guarantee there's plenty of people out there who have not got interested or gotten interviews or attention because what they say on this amount of paper or on the screen, so to speak, has not been effective. So it's really important. It's a nice, strong, positive message. It's sort of saying, I'm a valid applicant. I'm in the right space. I've got values that relate to what you're looking for and here's the proof to back it up. Now, we have no idea in every single case how much of this people read, in which order they read it, but that isn't the point either. Whatever they read, whichever part they focus on, is functional, technical, demonstrable, hard evidence, and linked to what they're looking for. So it's hard for them to escape from the fact that it is a very well-focused document. Whereas for most people's CVs, Relatively speaking, they're quite hideous because they're not targeted, they're too generic, too me too, and easy to dismiss. So get this bit right, and this virtually can guarantee that level of increment of success that I talked about earlier. Okay, now interestingly, you'll note we still don't yet know, and we haven't talked about where on earth, in this case, Matt, or our fictitious finance director earlier, we have no idea where they've worked. Now, how many people are opening up on their CV and the first thing they mention pretty much is where they currently work, their career history? So I would suggest that's the wrong thing to do because you don't know what picture people are going to paint in their mind where they see who you're working for. If you work for a big brand, fine, it might help you, but which part of that big brand? How, how do you really know whether people are going to respond positively to that big brand or not? Now, if you work for a smaller business that nobody's ever heard of, why would you lead with that on your CV? Why would you make that the focus of your CV? Particularly as most people don't explain who on earth they're working for. They just assume somebody's going to know who, again, some crystal ball, which doesn't exist. So this is why this business case is so important. You're building a, a story, if you like, a positive, compelling story as to why somebody should be interested in you. And it's highly unlikely that that story is going to begin with who are you currently working for? Ditto education. Even if you're a graduate, you ought not to be leading with your education. Why? Because most people share a similar level of education in the market that you're in. So if you're a graduate, rather sadly, there are so many graduates looking for jobs right now that leading with your education, even if you've got a really high level of education results-wise, is not as differentiating as you might think. Far more constructive is to build a business case as to why somebody should be interested in you, supported by your quality of education. If you've got a career that's fairly lengthy, you certainly ought not to be opening up with your education. It's probably the least differentiating thing you could start with. So again, ask yourself, what are you starting your CV? What are you opening up with? And how quickly are you getting people to your career history? Because if you're going to it too quickly, that could also be a reason why you're maybe not as successful as you'd like to be. So other sections of the CV, remembering we've talked about three areas so far, the three most important areas to build a business case. We do at some stage have to talk about where you've been working, of course, and that does follow fairly swiftly. It's the fourth section of the CV. Not a lot you can do about this. You know, It is representative of what you've done and where you've been. Um, but for that reason, we don't lead with it. It is important it, that it's on page one of your CV still. Now, we, I didn't show you the bottom of Matt's CV, but this is where his career history starts, right at the bottom, page one. That is important. It is also important you start in reverse chronological order. So you start with your most recent or current role, work backwards. Most people do that in fairness. Some don't, but most people do. 
you should only provide detail, and I'll show you detail in a minute, for roughly, if you have a career longer than 10 years, the last 8 to 10 years. Again, this is bespoke. It all depends who you're trying to target, what you're trying to target, how long your career is, and who's your career been with. It all contributes to how your CV should be structured. But as a broad indicator, detail the last 8 to 10 years. So going back in this, uh, where are we now, 2014, so roughly 2004, 5, roughly. In each of those roles that you detail, some background, who on earth do you work for, what are they, what size, structure, how do you fit in, some, some duties and responsibilities, but not lots. Do not dump your job description in here, and do not replicate all the things that you do that you've done for the last four or five roles. So if you've done VAT returns, you don't need to keep saying VAT returns. Get clever about it. That's not helping your business case. It just makes it look really boring and uninteresting. VAT returns also is almost meaningless. Yes, you need to demonstrate you've got that capability, but try and add some substance to it. And the way you do that is you focus on your achievements. They are the thing that differentiates you. So if you're in, let's say, accounts, let's stick with the VAT theme. If you're in accounts doing some kind of root role that involves VAT or HMRC or reconciliations or profit and loss forecast or cash flow forecasting or whatever it may be, those responsibilities are similar across all of the different functions that people have in competitive businesses. So if you're an accountant, accounts assistant, account executive, whatever you are, pretty much everybody in your kind of job has similar duties and responsibilities. So listing them on your CV is almost pointless. You need a bit of scope, but you really need to focus on the achievements, what you've done with those duties and responsibilities that differentiates you from your competition. At some point, for those that have a career longer than, say, 10 years, roughly, uh, of course, you need to explain your earlier career. So uh, for those of you that it applies, you do need to talk about what happened in the noughties or early part of the noughties, the 90s, possibly the 80s, maybe even the 70s. But anything beyond this 10-year horizon, just a line from two dates, employer, job title, end of. I can virtually guarantee there are a few exceptions, but in most people's cases, there is no point in detailing what happened in the 90s, 80s, 70s, or before. It adds no value, probably harms you more than anything else, sadly, but has no advantage. It's not going to secure you interviews, so don't focus on stuff that isn't relevant. Of course, we need to talk about qualifications. I'll show you Matt's CV and how this is laid out, but qualifications, this is pretty much the order that you put these things, by the way, so qualifications come fairly low down the batting order. If you've got specific qualifications that are worth mentioning, as I said earlier, you can get them in by way of some mention in the professional summary, opening statement on your CV, so i.e. an experienced graduate um, or an MBA student or a PRINCE2 qualified project manager or an ACCA qualified or FCCA qualified accountant. You can get those kind of words in right up front because they are important, but the details of your qualifications, any continued professional development, training, courses, that can all go towards the back of the CV. They'll still be picked up by databases and search engines, but you don't need to lead with them on your CV. Even, as I say, for recent graduates, it's not your most differentiating quality. Sometimes controversially so, this applies to personal details. If, if you noticed on Matt's CV, he had his name and two contact numbers. That was it. You don't have any idea yet where he lives. Um, in most cases, again, there's some, maybe some exceptions, but in most cases, people open up their CV, and the very first thing is, other than the words maybe curriculum vitae, wholly pointless, or their name, of course, which is most important, that's what you need to start with. But details of how people can contact you, marital status, date of birth, address, um, children, hobbies, all of that stuff on page one of your CV really is not appropriate for a whole host of reasons I don't have time to go into right now, particularly regarding address, but trust me, it's not, not important and can sometimes harm you, a postcode lottery of the wrong type, literally. So shunt all that stuff towards the back of the CV. Um, another classic, people tend to put on their CV, ask yourself this question, I guarantee some of you will have this, references available on request. Some people still say that you should put that on your CV, but 
really ask yourself why. The CV's job is to get you an interview. Having references available on request is not going to make any difference as to whether you get an interview or not, unless you've specifically been asked to provide information or evidence of references as part of the application process. That is unlikely. Some jobs do ask for it, but most aren't interested. Their reference checking process is fixed. They'll ask you for references at a certain point in time, normally much later in the recruitment process. So why waste space talking about stuff that's not relevant to getting you an interview? Far more productively, if you've got people who can provide any testimonial evidence from appraisals, emails, letters, LinkedIn sources, because LinkedIn obviously encourages recommendations, get some of that information onto your CV. Far more effective, as we'll see on maths shortly. And I've hinted at this, um, but in the sense of positioning, unless you have a hobby or interest that is directly related to your chosen career path, particularly if you're going to make a career switch, so um, that's important. If you've got a hobby or interest that is material to you changing your career direction, that might be worth mentioning on your CV because it's building your business case. It's helping to describe to your audience something that's relevant. But the fact that you support a particular football team or that you read lots of books or you like cooking and your job has got nothing to do with the food industry or the pub industry or hotel and catering, what, why? What, what, what's important? How is that going to help you get an interview? In fact, in, there is some evidence that if you, you could get that spectacularly wrong by saying that you're an ardent such and such fan and your CV lands on the desk of somebody who's an ardent opposing club fan, if you get my drift. That shouldn't happen. But even if, even if the worst that it did was to taint that person's mind as to who you might be and what you might represent, why do it? There's just no relevance. So think very carefully about that. Don't fall into the trap of just listing a whole heap of things. There are all sorts of wise tales about people analyzing that and looking for solitary pursuits, group or team activities. That unless, unless it's hugely relevant to the job, don't mention it at all. Let people ask you that at an interview. Don't skewer your chances of getting the interview by being too open about what you're interested in. OK, uh, let's take a look at Matt's example again, just to show you how some of this all stitches together. Let me first show you, this is the whole of page one of Matt's CV. And you can see just at the bottom of page one is his most recent, and in other words for him, his current job. That is important. Again, I don't have time to go into reasons why, but trust me, if you're delaying, so I said there's a problem with going into this too quickly, so having your career history too far up page one could be an issue. It's equally an issue if you have it on page two or beyond of your CV. Again, I don't have time to go into why, but you have to trust me on that one. If we look at then page two of Matt's CV, which is just coming onto the screen now, you'll see a continuation of his current role. Quite a lot of detail here. Some scene setting, who on earth the business is that he's working for, how does he fit in structurized, who are the people working for him and what kind of functions do they have, and then quite a bit on key achievements or assignments. So it depends a little bit on what kind of role you have, but this is the stuff that nobody else could lay claim to. So if Matt had a competitor in the job market who also ran a CV writing business um, and had a similar sort of career, this is the bit that that person couldn't claim. Some of the earlier stuff the person could claim, you know, similar kind of business, similar kind of reporting structure, similar size, similar kind of responsibilities. But the stuff nobody else can lay claim to is what Matt's actually done with those responsibilities. Same works for you as well. Bottom of page two, second employment chunk. Um, now, this is quite an old CV, so actually now you're on the borderline of whether this should be detailed or not time-wise. But it's only the second job we're going back in Matt's case, so it's still on his CV. A little bit less detail, but still detailed. And if we flick, flick to the final page, third page, you can see, again, the bottom of, um, or rather the rump of his second job, the Hayes. Earlier career is just the one line that I hinted at. Then education, personal details, recommendations. Recommendations are optional. If you have them, really powerful. If you don't, don't worry about it. But in your future career, think about getting testimonial evidence from people you've worked with, or for, I should say. Ideally, managers, people who've employed you, um, bosses of companies, not peer group stuff or friends you meet down the pub every Friday. Okay, 
So that's that's how it sort of comes together. A brief moment of reflection now. We've covered a lot of areas on the CV. You've got to get into LinkedIn very briefly. Um, but hopefully now you've got enough information or at least um, data to start thinking, how far away am I from this so-called ideal? So here are just a few things to remember. If you're not getting the interviews you deserve, it's the CV that's a problem, not you, because people don't know you from Adam. So don't take it personally. It's the CV that's causing the problem or combination of CV and LinkedIn, but the message you're sending out there. You now know whether you can make those kind of statistical calculations. If you're applying for lots of jobs, you know that you could perform those jobs based on the evidence at your disposal. You can make the calculation and you can say, you know, have I got an issue or not? And if you're not building a business case, if you're nowhere near to being, being able to present a good, strong argument as to why somebody should be interviewing you, you're just going to market with a list. That's probably the root cause of your problem. And just to refine that a little bit more, ask yourself the question, has my CV got relevant evidence of my success on it? Now, you have to be quite harsh about that. If you're just talking about a few things that you think are impressive, but you're not really sure whether they are or not, or whether they're relevant to the marketplace, be harsh about it, mark yourself down. And if you haven't got any relevant information at all, then it's a big fat red cross. Then you can make a decision. Now, if I've talked about the negative side, in fairness, um, I suppose for obvious reasons, most CVs I see fail to score. If I was crudely scoring them, most would get a 4 or 5 out of 10, 10 being ideal for the target audience, 1 being so far removed, somebody ought to do something about it. Most are sort of a 4 or 5. Very few get more than a 5. So on the basis of most people tend not to be that successful, um, but there are always some people who are. So if you are in that, on that more positive note, if you're getting the 7, 8, 9, 10 interviews out of the 10 applications, in fairness, you probably don't need to do anything, and by changing your CV, it's not going to materially affect those statistics. So you should pat yourself on the back. Um, in fact, you shouldn't even be here now. You should probably go off and do something else, because nobody's going to improve on that. But most people aren't there, unfortunately. So the do-nothing is only an option for people who are actually getting good level of interviews. If you're having a problem with the interviews and they're not progressing to second interview or assessment center, that's a wholly different situation. That's got more to do with the interview technique than it has the CV. For those that have got a problem with the CV because of the reasons we've discussed this evening, as I said, you've got um, two choices really. You fix it yourself and people could be capable of doing that. that that's well within the remit of people who are into that sort of thing. But if you're struggling with that and thinking, I, I really don't know what to do, I don't even want to do it, you can get help. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But at least that help exists. And for those interested in that option, then at the end of all of these webinars, we have a really good deal which we offer people so that if you're in that camp or thinking that you might be in that camp, all is not lost. Help is available. Um, very briefly, I'm going to only focus on a couple of things here because we need to cover off LinkedIn and um, time is upon us. Um, a bit of an urban myth about um, number of pages on a CV. Uh, there is no real rule of whatever anybody may tell you. Um, we generally write CVs that are prob uh, probably averages three pages, so a bit like the Max example you saw today. Some go to four, some are two. Never has anybody come back to us and said, you're a bunch of idiots, you gave me a CV that's X pages long and the market demands this and I've not got an interview as a consequence. It just doesn't happen. What people get fed up with is poor quality CVs on any number of pages and in a desperate bid to try and restrict the amount of rubbish sent in their general direction, some people say, oh, a CV should only be a page or two pages long. Now, the exception to that rule, of course, is if somebody has specifically asked as part of the application process that you should submit details on X number of pages, you'd be mad not to follow that instruction if that were there. But that doesn't often happen. More often than not, it's submit a CV. And what people don't like getting is rubbish content on either one, two, three, four, five, or any number of pages. And I say it's a bit of a myth. This It should be a number of pages. Most important thing is the content. If you've got good content, doesn't matter whether they read all of it or some of it, it will work its magic. Whether it's two, three, or four pages doesn't matter. Um, spelling is the only other thing I want to pick out of this um, series of other comments. 
spelling is still a reason why people could reject you immediately and nobody is going to uh, accuse a, a recruiter of making a bad decision if you've given them a CV with a spelling mistake on it or a grammatical error that's substantial, in some cases not even so substantial. So really pay attention to that. I'd say still a good healthy double digit percentage of CVs that I see have spelling mistakes on and they normally follow a comment something like great attention to detail. I have great attention to detail or a key skill of mine is attention to detail. That is a classic example of a skill you, do, you ought not to have on your CV, partly because it's behavioral again to some degree. It's very hard to actually prove positively, but incredibly easy to prove negatively and get yourself wiped out the process just by making one mistake. And most people who say great attention to detail are one that then have a spelling mistake and it encourages you to look for that kind of error. That's the sort of um, masochistic tendencies in most people reviewing CVs. So really pay attention to getting this spelling right. As far as LinkedIn is concerned, um, briefly, but unsurprisingly, this follows a similar theme. Uh, there are certain bits to get really right, uh, and, it, and it is really important that you get them right on LinkedIn. And if you're not on LinkedIn and you're in any kind of commercial mainstream role, you really ought to consider being on it. I'm not going to go into the merits now about whether you should or should not be on it and who it works for and who it doesn't. Suffice to say, it is a massively important tool to get noticed, and that includes graduates with no experience but looking to get into anything like finance, IT, HR, sales, purchasing, procurement, public, private sector, so virtually anything you can imagine, to be honest. So um, if you've got any questions about that, ask me later on the merits of being on or out of LinkedIn, but our view is you should probably be on it. Recruiters and hiring managers use it massively now. LinkedIn makes most of its money from recruiters paying subscriptions for advanced recruitment solutions, not from subscriptions from the likes of you and I. Comment at the bottom of the screen is quite important. Um, you remember I said the vast majority of recruiters and hiring managers can only judge you on your content, the contents of your CV, which is true. Of that large majority, another large chunk of those people will suss you out on LinkedIn before deciding to interview you. So if you've got um, a dodgy CV, um, but it wasn't quite dodgy enough to get you rejected from the filtering process, and then you've got a LinkedIn profile that doesn't actually help your cause or contradicts anything on your CV. And again, you'd be surprised how many people's profiles and CVs are way out of kilter. You could lose it at this very last stage. Um, out with tonight's session is the fact that they'll also probably check you out on Facebook and Twitter, and some companies will have advanced software just to make that process very easy. So be very wary of what you're doing out in the uh, ether, but on LinkedIn particularly, just make sure you've got a complimentary message. I said it's very important. It's not just about people who are currently in the job market, interestingly. If you're wanting to build a profile, get recognition for the future, the middle to longer term, get on LinkedIn now and start building that profile. Don't just suddenly jump on when you're desperately looking for a job. It, it, it won't harm you in the sense that you know, it's, not, it's better to be on it than not on it, I guess. But it's far better to have built up some connections, some recognition, some profile, um, and some longevity. But don't just take your CV, which most people do, and dump it into LinkedIn, because it, LinkedIn's different. Don't get hung up about technical issues. So LinkedIn encourages you to fill it out with lots of information, from education all the way through to qualifications, work history, blah de blah de blah you don't need to fill in every form or box on LinkedIn. It will encourage you to do so, and it will encourage you by its profile strength indicator. If you know what that's about, you'll know what I mean. But it will lure you into a sort of false sense of security. Give me more information. I will make your profile appear more holy by giving it a sort of a, a score, which goes sort of basic, intermediate, advanced, expert, blah, blah, blah. Um, what it fails to tell you is that by contributing certain things to LinkedIn to gain you these points to make your profile look better um, is merely a box ticking exercise. So adding a photo will gain you a stronger profile. Uh, unfortunately, that photo could be of a monkey or a banana or a mon monkey eating a banana, and it would still get you a higher profile strength, which is a bit ridiculous, of course. So 
don't worry about filling in everything. The quality of the content, just like your CV, this is where the similarities are. Good content on CV, you need good content on your LinkedIn profile. You don't need to fill every single box or become a technical expert. So the important thing, again, on the CV, there are three key areas. LinkedIn similar, there are probably three, again, key areas to get right that makes a difference, that builds your business case, that complements the strength of your CV, that will get you noticed and make getting interviews a, an easier task. First one of those is your professional headline. If you don't know where that is, I'll show you very shortly. If the piece of text appears under your name on your LinkedIn profile, make sure it isn't by default your job title and current employer, which is what LinkedIn will encourage you to have. Definitely make sure it's not something that says available now, currently seeking, actively looking. It makes you look desperate. It's the wrong sentiment. Um, underneath the professional headline, is a box where you can put sort of a summary, a bit like the professional summary on a CV. Um, I'll just show you quickly. Here's Matt's LinkedIn profile. The professional headline is the text I've just read over under, 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 under his name, starting ND and career enhancements leader. Basically, this is value proposition. He's on this planet to drive success in the job market for individuals. That's what he's here to do. That's what your message needs to be. Not just ND or finance accountant, or senior accountant, because loads of people are called that. And if you've got a weird job title, putting it in here is not helping your cause, because people say, well, what on earth is that? And if you're trying to move up the ladder, if you've called yourself a count assistant and you really want to be a senior accountant, and you could quite easily be, why make it easy for people to dismiss you or just pick you at the wrong level? So think really hard about what you put in there. The summary, unsurprisingly, is a bit headed summary. Um, and contains information about what Matt's value proposition is, what he's good at, what he is, and aligning that to the hot skills in the marketplace. Again, very similar. Notice that he uses the word I. LinkedIn and CV, they differ in the tense you use and the person from which you write. That's actually quite important. Again, don't have time to go into the detail of that right now, but there is a difference in the way you lay out the content to get it absolutely right. When you're listing jobs that you've done, just provide summaries, not the detail. So that isn't a copy and paste from the CV, even if it was one of our CVs. It's a summary of stuff that you've done. And an area that people tend not to use, most many people don't even know it actually exists, called projects. So they're a great area for putting the career highlights that we put on our CVs. So if you go to your profile, for those that have one, you go on the edit profile mode, and then there's a, doesn't, it depends where it appears in the precise order on your own profile. This is my profile, I've gone into edit mode, the highlighted area is a project section, you click on that, you get a screen like this. And it allows you to enter a name of a project, so for example, with, with um, the example we saw earlier, it was Enterprise Rent-A-Car, you remember that? Uh, the uh, example off Matt's CV, where he had to turn around a, a business that Enterprise Rent-A-Car had existed. So in the name here, you could enter something like you know, business turnaround, or rapid um, return to profitability, or um, business acquisition turnaround, or something like that, a nice punchy headline. You link that project to the occupation you had at the time. And then in the description area, you provide the text. So enterprise rent car had acquired an unprofitable competitor in the south of Eastern, blah, 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 and you have the text that was pretty much on the CV in the star or using the star formula that we talked about. Now, on LinkedIn, you can have loads of those, or you can have two or three. It doesn't really matter. CV, we'd probably have three. LinkedIn, you can have loads. And they really provide the evidence to support what you're good at. Final comment on LinkedIn, um, all of the sections are drag and drop, well, mo most of them are. So you can reposition the flow of it to build that business case. So by default, if you start adding sections like projects, they drop to the bottom of your profile. They're not much use at the bottom. Move them around, get them in a better order. When we're writing LinkedIn profiles for our clients, we reorder the whole section so it flows in a nice logical flow and there's a nice compelling business case to why somebody should be interested in them. Okay, we're almost done. Um, for those people, there have been a fair few questions asked already I've seen. I, I will deal with them shortly. A lot of people have said, okay, well, how can you help, blah, 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 blah. So I'll deal with that first so that if people need to leave when I've wrapped up, you, you've gone with part of the questions answered. 
Um, so if we, if you're thinking, okay, I need help, I can't do this myself. Um, there'll be some of you thinking I can do it myself. There may be some people who think they don't need any help, and, and that's fine. If that, if you truly believe that. But if you're thinking oh, I do need help, if we're going to do this for you, then we rewrite your CV and LinkedIn profile from scratch. So it's not an amendment, it's not a tweak, it's not a refinement, it's a room branch complete overhaul of both tools, CV and LinkedIn profile. The way we do that is we hold uh, an interview with you over the telephone or Skype and we collect all the raw data from you in the nicest possible way so that we can clarify the career objective that you have, make sure we understand that and actually give it a bit of a sanity check as well. If you don't already know it, we can work with you to make sure that you do understand from a third party's perspective what your true value on this planet is at this moment in time and how to uh, um, explain that to people. We then extract again using the raw data we've got, um, we extrapolate what you're good at, where you can add some value and write all those achievements and career highlights using the STAR methodology. So effectively what we're doing is we're building that business case for you. So the, the real horsepower bit is those three sections of the CV. Opening statement, bullet pointed skills, career highlights. We can do all of that for anybody at any level. And what I can guarantee you is that if you've got a stronger business case, now again, this is whether you've written it, we've written it, or anybody with a competent ability amongst them, as long as you've done that and you've got a stronger business case, you will get more interviews. So if that's a problem, it has a solution. It can be fixed. And it will also get you interviews to better jobs, unsurprisingly, I suppose. If you're putting a stronger business case, you'd be surprised how much you can pitch. There's plenty of people who've been able to go for jobs that, at first glance, they thought maybe they could they could just couldn't get the message right. You can make that much of a jump as long as you align what you've got to offer from your toolkit to skills to the target audience effectively. If you can't do that justifiably, it's not going to work, of course. But if you can, and it's just a problem of articulation and presentation, that can be fixed. So then you can do the math. You can start working out, OK, if I've got a job, if I need a job, I can get a job quicker, what's that worth to me? If I can get a better job, that's paying more at a better level within a better company, what's that worth to me? You can put a value on it. And if you've got that, then you can decide whether our special offer that we should have for webinar customers actually makes sense or not, whether it's worth the investment. So ordinarily, to do all of the things I said, get your CV profiles, CV sorted and your LinkedIn profile sorted, again, from scratch. That would ordinarily cost 349 quid plus that. So it's not a cheap business, I'm afraid. It, it takes a lot of time and effort. But for people who are interested in that this evening, we're doing a special deal where that's reduced to 275 plus fat. So you save a lot of money, almost 90 quid in fact. We time limit those deals, so that expires, close of play Friday 7th of March. So um, we've got uh, just this working week really when that deal applies. But the first 10 customers that order, and it's always on a first come first serve basis, both in terms of time allocation and any other bits and pieces we do. For the first 10 customers, we'll also give you a free cover letter, which is worth almost 40 quid. And if you're interested in that, there's a special place you have to go, which I'm now going to stick into um, the chat facility. And uh, if you click on this link, what you'll be directed to is a web page of ours which will allow you to find a little bit more about the service. In fact, I'll show you what the web page looks like just in case you're interested. You'll go to that web page. Um, there's explanation of the deal, some feedback from clients, question and answer session, frequency asked questions, that kind of thing. Click on the button, do the business, and we'll process the order and get things sorted. Um, if there's anybody out there who's just interested in having a go themselves and wants some extra help, some templates and a workbook, if you fancy having a go at yourself, there's a on the same web page using the same link that I've given you, there's a sort of a DIY pack for uh, 18 quid including the VAT, um, which will help you with a few bits and pieces. I mean, that, that really, you know, if you fancy having a go, it gives you a bit of a sort of toe in the water. If you, during the process, give up, can always come back to us and we'll we'll knock 15 quid off the CV price or do something for you if you if you give up in desperation and need somebody to help you. 
For any other queries or thoughts other than questions tonight, by all means drop us a line, visit our website, send us an email. Um, there's various facilities of contacting us. You can give us a ring, our number's on the website. More than happy to help. But for those that um, need to go, that, that's the session done now. Um, so I thank you very much for your time. I hope you got something out of that. I know it's an awful lot to go through, but um, I trust you to get this done properly is not the work of a moment, and we try and pull out the key parts. If you get those key parts right, I guarantee you'll be more successful. Whether you do it, we do it, or anybody else does it, if you get it sorted, it will make a difference. So that's the main point of this evening. Um, I promise I'll deal, deal with the questions. So I'll move into that phase now. Um, just give me a couple of moments breathing space to look at the questions that have been asked. But those that need to leave now, you're welcome to go, and I thank you for your time. Now, if you just bear with me, I shall move on to the um, questions. Uh, da, da, 